Welcome to the RevOps Lab, a podcast exploring the art and science of revenue operations. To find more episodes and resources on scaling your revenue engine, visit getweflow.com slash RevOps. Hey, Janis. Hey, Philip. So what are we talking about today? Yeah, today we're talking with Paul Kallenberger from Hey Jobs. Paul runs his 25 people RevOps team, like a product management department. And we go deep on the frameworks HeyJob uses to measure success and how they run the organization. This is a fantastic episode to help you think about how to structure and organize your RevOps team. So please listen and enjoy. Paul Kallenberger, hey, great to have you. Hey, Anis. Hey, Philip. Nice to meet you. Great to have you here. Um, you know, we've known each other for a while and, you know, I've been following your work. Um, maybe you can give uh, the audience a, a quick introduction about yourself. Sure. Um... So originally, I, I come from natural science. I uh, did a lot of chemistry, bachelor's, master's, and then worked at uni for a while. Um, had a short stint in consultancy for two years where we helped um, automotive manufacturers with model-based system engineering. And then again, by chance, ended up in, in tech. Um, and I, I really liked the, the fast-moving side of it and then stumbled into revenue operations actually about three and a half years ago. And since then have been doing revenue operations and product in different varieties uh, at Hey Jobs and still doing it and loving it. Yeah, fantastic. I mean, I'm super curious, like uh, if you could tell us a bit more about, you know, Hey Jobs, uh, how big is your team? What's the setup? How big is the company? Yeah, so um, hey Jobs is, uh, you can imagine it as a marketplace. We're trying to connect talents with open jobs at companies. And it's a two-sided business. We have the talent side where we try to cater a good experience to talents that want to find a new job. And we have the company side where companies want to fill open positions. And our revenue operations team is located on the companies, or as we call it, employer side, um, as these are our paying customers and we want to help make our go-to-market motion as efficient as possible. Um, and uh, the revenue operations team at HeyJobs, as in any company, has gone through some kind of journey, I would say, with a, with a change of the size of the company and the journey of the company. So when I uh, joined HeyJobs, we didn't have revenue operations at all. And I think three months in, we formed revenue operations. The back then CRO pushed for it which I really liked. And um, somehow, I think by, by chance and by some circumstances, I ended up leading that team, um, which was like a big thing for me because I haven't worked on Salesforce before, for example, and then just dived into that. Um, about a year later, we decided, okay, we need to professionalize this and split up the team into a strategy team and a systems team. And I became in charge of the systems team and started building this out as a product team, basically. So looking at our go-to-market systems and processes as a as a product, um, and then my my role was more of a product manager in the function of revenue operations. Um, and then uh, some time back, we decided, okay, with the stage of the company, we need to unify all of the efforts to drive efficiency in our go-to-market motion, and we rebuild revenue operations as a whole. Um, and now we're, I think, around 25 people with four distinct areas within revenue operations. Um, yeah, and that's that's where we stand right now and how we go forward in 2024. So I'd love to double click on that. Like, when did you do the switch between, um, you know, the technical and the strategy part? And then what are the four areas you have today? So um, I think we did that switch to split it up around yeah, two and a half years ago because we said, okay, we need to drive our strategy forward um, with, with consultants that have experience in building out strategies of companies. Um, so we split up the teams and around half a year ago, we merged the teams back together um, to, to holistically have this ownership for efficiency and effectiveness of our go-to-market teams. And currently, our revenue operations uh, consists of the four teams, which is intelligence, excellence, technology, and services. And I think intelligence, technology, and excellence is very common in revenue operations. Our services team um, is something 
that I see really well fits into revenue operations, but not many companies do it like that, I believe. And this team is responsible to basically solve everything that we cannot productize. Everything that remains manual work in our organization is covered by the services team. They are the first point of contact for any requests from our sales teams, for example. And they have, I think, 20 different hats and solve 100 different problems, but in a very manual fashion. And yeah, they cover what we cannot cover with our systems, basically. So this sounds almost to me like you're having one team that is responsible for all the nitty gritty things that matter, but maybe are not strategic. Uh, is that a fair view? I'm not sure if, you know, people would like to hear that, but, you know, I mean, to a certain extent, I think if you think of the idea of service desk, right, and SLAs, I think it's a very common uh, structure. I'm curious how you think about that. Yeah. I mean, you said not strategic, and I would challenge that a bit because, for one, it's a strategic decision not to automate or productize the topics that they're working on. And the other thing is, obviously, from that team comes a lot of push to actually change processes or, in the end, optimize or really automate them because this is the team that is closest to the action and that realizes, hey, we're doing a repetitive thing. Now a pattern shows up. We can automate this so there is some strategic work involved there but it's all the nitty-gritty where nobody else knows what to do they come in and they pick it up and they do it yes and everybody who's listening to ref up slab right we we are very deep in you know iterative improvements we think that's super important to build a better revenue engine and is is uh, in that sense uh yeah i think the idea of strategic versus not strategic is also a bit of a linkedin discussion i don't really like uh but But I think it's, yeah, I think it's great that you have, you know, people who are looking more at maybe the mid to long term versus, you know, others who are really in the day to day um, and you separate that out. So, 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 so clearly, um, I know Philip is eager to ask questions, so I'll shut up now. <laughs> no, no, all good. All good. And <laughs> um, I, I, have, I have two questions. One, one where I just want to a bit like clarify sort of like the, the ratio at Hey Jobs um, between you know, RevOps and the sales org uh, or RevOps and the marketing org, like maybe like maybe we sum that up as, as one one bigger group. Um, so I'm just curious about that. I think um, I think it's an just interesting stats to always look at and to understand because I think it gives an insight into, you know, how 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 serious RevOps is taken and revenue excellence is taken at an organization. And then you mentioned like, you know, product. Um, that you that you build out like the RevOps team um, sort of like like a product team and I'm just curious like you know without going into the details already there but like just like what you mean by that like sort of like what's the underlying philosophy that you that you thought uh, through for the RevOps team uh, maybe starting with, with the with the headcount part um, I think this is I, I like to look at these numbers for different companies also but I find it's a lot a lot of flaw in there because um, some some areas might not be called revenue operations, but do exactly what revenue operations does. So you see a count of one to 20 and you think, wow, these poor people, they have so much work. But then <laughs> there might be another team that is actually <laughs> covering a lot of this. I think we have around 200 marketing for sales and with a services team, we're at 25 RevOps. Um, with taking that service part out, I think around 15 so yeah, it's a ratio of I don't know one to thirteen, one to fifteen, kind of. How many are in services, and in uh, like, what, how does it split across technology excellence, intelligence, and services? Um, so services is around ten, a bit more than ten. Um, technology is five, and intelligence we are ramping up right now. Going to be four. We are at one right now, so some some way to go there. And join Paul. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. We have open positions for that. And um, <laughs> on the excellent side, we are four at the moment as well. Exactly. And then circling back, Philip, to your product question. So I think running your tech stack as a product is super helpful because then you stop looking at, okay, we have HubSpot and we have Salesforce and we have Zapier and we try to connect everything. But you say, okay, we have our revenue platform or revenue systems and we use it to solve problems. And with that, you go away from somebody saying, hey, um, 
I need this button in Salesforce, uh, please implement it for me. But you go to a setup where you say, okay, let's talk. What is the problem you try to solve? And then maybe we find out your solution doesn't match to the problem uh, you actually have. And you can look at the, the system as a whole and say, no, what you actually need is something implemented in HubSpot. So a data point gets forwarded to Salesforce and then you can use it. And this way of thinking to put the problem first and dive into the problem very deep to understand what is the right solution for that problem rather than being super reactive as a Salesforce admin, for example, and just creating fields for people or buttons for people. Um, this is one part of the, the product mindset that I feel is extremely helpful to implement in revenue operations. And then you also start thinking on how can you increase the value of this product you're internally delivering in a long term and not just put out fires in the short term. So this is very high level why I think revenue operations in general is very or should be very product-like and especially on the system side and maybe the intelligence side as well, actually. Okay, I have so many questions. <laughs> this is the topic for today, you know. Um, so, so, so uh, let's maybe kick off and really double click into all this um, a lot, a lot further. Um, so, are there specific frameworks you're applying um, for your revenue operations planning and uh, you know um, execution? Yeah, um, I think it, first I want to mention that like I feel there's a hundred frameworks out there and. All of them themselves, they don't solve a problem, right? Uh, I think with the right mindset, you solve problems, but you can borrow from different frameworks because people tried things before and learned there's good ways to do this or not. And then you can pitch something together that works for you. And I think one super common example in, in product is Scrum, right? There's uh, a lot of Scrum coaches out there that tell you, yeah, use Scrum and all your problems are gone. Um, I feel there's a lot within Scrum with the right mindset, if you use it right, that has great value for you. But I would never go with a framework and say, okay, we're applying this framework now. Um, so in our team, for example, what we do is we have daily stand-ups. We, some time ago, worked in sprints. So we have a Jira board. Um, we had weekly sprints at that moment. We write tickets. Um, we can dive into how we do that in a bit, maybe. And then we would um, have a refinement session to make everybody understand what these tickets are meant to solve or what's the objective behind them and then discuss technical solutions. And then the, the engineering team or Salesforce team would go about implementing these solutions. Um, and at some point we realize, okay, we need like these short sprints of a week, which is a bit uncommon because our go-to-market organization is moving very fast and they need things now and not in three weeks. So we had these one week sprints, but for the Salesforce admin team and the developers, that was not ideal because every week they felt, okay, this is too big to solve. We are not there yet. And they, they tried to push out stuff very fast. That was not complete. So one idea was, okay, let's go to two week sprints and give them a bit more time. And we played around with that idea and said, no, let's actually kill sprints completely and go to a Kanban cycle where we continuously move tickets through the board that comes with different challenges also. So we need to make sure we commit to finishing things and we need a work in progress limit to make sure we don't have 20 open tasks with, with someone. Um, but this, this a bit weird idea in the beginning solved the problem in a very good way. So we are very um, much able to react quickly to changes in the go-to-market org, but also we have a way of tracking our work very well and making people commit to finishing things. So... That was one thing that I really felt I wouldn't have thought that, but just trying it out really helped to ditching some of the Scrum framework rules, basically. For, from a product management um, experience, I would also feel like Scrum often adds a lot of um, headcounts, particularly if you have like a team where, I mean, if it's purely engineering, I think it can work. But then if you add, if there's like other sort of like functions in that and they are also required to do scrum then i think it yeah like the the overhead that it adds and the time that it requires to go through the process and respect all sort of like the um ceremonies um that that you do 
even if you cut them short, it, I think it's it, yeah, it's just often not worth it. And and if your team is really experienced and you have a good culture, and and these two things come together, then I think Kanban is just like so efficient and because it it eliminates so much need for um, uh, communication. Um, I mean, still, of course, it's good to have communication going, right? Um, but it's just such an efficient way. And at the same time, uh, it makes your work so transparent to the rest of the organization. So the marketing team, and I assume this is probably one of the challenges you try to solve with that, the marketing team always knows where sort of like the asks and requests stand in the in the priority and uh, yeah, what the current status is really. I have to say we can get better at that still uh, to give transparency into where we stand. But one thing you mentioned is super important. I think moving from, let's say, Scrum to Kanban, it doesn't work with a very junior team that doesn't know how to work together yet. Because this commitment of I finish something at that specific point in time is super important with a junior team. But if you have established a good work routine and you can rely on each other, you don't need that specific end of the sprint, but you can do this in a Kanban way and that is um, a good thing that we learned also that there's a right time to make that switch basically with the maturity of the team I want to get very very tactical here so like do you have multiple boards do you have one board do you have multiple backlogs um, you know how do you write your tickets uh, do you have like accept criteria yeah uh, it's, it's really double in click in on, on this yeah uh, this is continuously developing right we're trying and changing um, the the technology team for a while is using one board basically to to implement things in our systems. Um, but then now combining all the other areas of revenue operations, um, we don't want to force them to use Jira. For example, on the excellence team, you don't have the, the natural need to have something like Jira to use to track your tasks. Um, but what we do together is to prioritize objectives that we want to address as revenue operations and we're using a discovery board for that where we basically enter our objectives and refine them together and distribute them into the teams and then the teams decide how they want to pick up these objectives they they move them into their roadmap or their timelines um, and then pick it up from there they can do it in a doc they can do it in Jira they can track the work however they want to and how do you bring how do you bring the roadmap together then, right? Like, uh, I mean, right, I, th I think the, the this idea of like RevOps discovery is similar to product discovery is, is, is always fascinating to me, like, right, because it sets the tone of what you actually work on and what the impact is. So, I mean, how do you, how do you, how do you know what to work on? How do you, yeah, and how do you track that and how do you structure that? Yeah. We're again experimenting with that at the moment. So uh, from in, in quarter four last year, still we had quarterly planning where each team would basically collect the things they think is most valuable to work on. And then we usually had check-ins with the senior management team and the relevant stakeholders. So everybody is aligned on why are we working on things and why are we not working on some of the things. Um and now we realize this is a bit of a burden to do that quarterly because there's always, you start the quarter, still catching up with the last quarter, then you have maybe one month in the quarter where you can actually focus on working, but then already move into planning again and everybody has to align on everything. Um, so it never feels like you're in the good space. You're never in the let's deliver things um, space. So what we did now, and we still need to see how that goes, is to move to continuous planning. So we we implemented this discovery board or objectives board basically and every week check in on these topics and prioritize them together um, to see which are the items that are most relevant for the business and now comes the part where we still need to get better we now need to give visibility for the stakeholders into this and help them to very easily understand why is something something prioritized and why is something deprioritized um, where using very simple frameworks for prioritization like ICE. But I have to say, I, I like that as a general guidance. But in the end, what happens a lot is then you adjust, let's say, impact. So the, the priori prioritization matches with your gut feel, right? So you want to take gut feel out. That's where you implement these frameworks. And then in the end, you're just moving around so your gut feel works again. <laughs> um, and and yeah. That's something that is very risky, I think. And something where we are trying to get better in 
connecting impact to, let's say, a certain amount of revenue that we expect from this change. Um, that comes with another downside, right? If you do ROI calculations, you can do them very fancy and turn up with, okay, this brings us 1 million, and then you do it and nobody ever looks at it again. So it becomes a science of just inventing numbers that look good. So there's all of these frameworks have, have big downsides and you need to find a way of the revenue operations organization or any part of the organization having a transparent alignment with the stakeholders, why things are done and why not. Um, and I think it should be as simple as possible rather than hundreds of calculation cases done everywhere. And your continuous planning process, I mean, who is part of that decision body? Um, and like, I assume you don't do it with executives every week or do you do it every week? Uh, do you have different forums where you basically make the decisions in the team and you know maybe in an alignment board or team uh, meeting? This is something that I really like at HeyJobs and probably part of why I'm still here. A lot of mandate is given to each individual area and team lead and individual, basically. So we are prioritizing the topics based on our understanding. And if we lack information, we get that information. And then we present this to senior stakeholders. Um, in the past, we did that quarterly. Now we still need to find the right frequency. And it's then based on if they challenge that, we discuss with them why and try to understand and potentially reprioritize because we might have missed some information. But it's on us to decide what we work on in the first place. And this is extremely helpful, I think, if you have the right people in place um, you can step away from all of these sign-off levels that you need to do for projects, right? Because you trust the people to do the right things. And I think one really important aspect on that is to have the right KPIs or internal metrics for the areas to enable that because people need to know what are they working towards, right? Um, I just curious, like, um, do you then also have something like release notes where you like then go around and talk to the sales team and the marketing team? Hey, these are all the things we changed. This is the change log. You can like look at the latest improvements that we did. Yeah, I would love to say yes. Um, yeah, but, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I can't. Um, that's yeah. also something where I think it's a it's a conflict of having a lot of process in place and standardizing things. And then you lose speed by doing so. And I think we're a bit too unstructured in some regards still, but that gives us the ability to move fast. Um, I think with and now we're in a place where we need to get better at, let's say, clearly communicating what we released. And we're thinking about, let's say, a weekly newsletter to inform everybody about changes that are relevant. But yeah, I, I receive a couple of newsletters every week internally and half of them is like, yeah, thank you for that newsletter. I'm not going to read that today. Uh, so it needs to generate value, I think. Um, so stakeholders look at them actually and not just have them in their inbox. Yeah. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, that's always the, the challenge, like speed and yeah, doing a bit slower, but then explaining everything really well and making sure everybody comes along for the journey. Um, yeah, it's, it's always, it's always tough. Like you, you mentioned, uh, I mean, we talked about Kanban, we talked about Scrum, any other frameworks, um, that, that you apply. I mean, there's like, I don't know, jobs to be done and there's OKRs very common in product management organizations. Uh, do you also apply those or, um, is Kanban sort of like the limit here? Cool. We, we used OKRs some time back uh, in the, in the whole organization. And then decided to not do that anymore. Um, one problem was that each quarter you get a new objective, you define new key results, you need to set up new tracking of these key results. Um, and that like makes you jump from one direction to the other, basically. Um, and what we did then as an organization is we implemented eternal metrics as drivers. So each team has to define the eternal metrics they work towards. And they keep being there. You can obviously change them if the market or the situation changes, but they should be constant. And then you can decide, is a project influencing this metric in the right way or not? And decide if you do something or not. So I think there's a lot of power in OKRs, but it, it can also go very wrong if you start using that. And I really like this eternal metrics idea 
that you define, and that's the complicated part. You need to have the right eternal metrics or KPIs for each of these teams, but then let them drive these metrics forward over a longer period of time and base decisions on that. Can you give a few examples of these metrics? Yeah, we are maybe maybe where we come from and the um, technology team is what we said. We have some main processes within Salesforce. Um, let's say closing the first deal with a customer. And we calculated how many manual steps are required to do this. And then we said, okay, within this next year, we want to reduce this number. And each quarter we set like an, a target of we want to take out 10% or five of these manual steps to give the reps more time back to actually do meaningful stuff. Um, and that worked quite well on like two of the core processes. We did good progress and then we realized, okay, now we need to touch another process. We need to implement a new analytics or counting method for a new process. And now we're in the, in the transition to changing that and saying, okay, we don't want to look at individual processes and cut out manual steps, but we want to look at how much time do the reps have for meaningful work. So we, we flip it around basically, and now we're implementing to track how much or how many meaningful activities per rep per month are we seeing in the organization, like calls over a certain duration or events with customers or meetings with customers. So now the technology team's focus is to bring that number up and to give them as much time back to actually have these meaningful interactions with customers. And they can do that by taking out administrative work. So the, the vision there is that Salesforce becomes a co-pilot rather than this thing where you need to enter data and that annoys you every day. Yeah. Yeah. We've heard about that before. One reason why we started WeFlow. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and it's, uh, it's, it's definitely, I think something that is overlooked often and, uh, the, the norm for many, unfortunately, uh, um, but yeah, that's a, that's a different topic. Um, um, I'm, I mean, it sounds almost to me like you're flipping it uh, around, right? You're basically starting with, okay, this could be the solution, but then, Hey, this is actually the metric we want to influence. And let's now discover what has the biggest impact on those metrics so that you can actually drive value. Is that, is that a fair assessment? Yeah, or? yeah, exactly. That sounds totally right. Yeah. I mean, one one remark I just want to make is I, I find that is actually a theme. You when when I hear you talking across the board is that you went from you know monthly or quarterly to almost like a continuous everything, right? So, and I think that is actually so important when you think of planning, when you think of you know execution, when you think of training that is actually continuously done. And the same is true with prioritization, right? Like, uh, I mean, Philip and I, I mean, we, we actually work very similarly uh, to what you described uh, in terms of how we develop our product. And it gives you a lot of flexibility to change the backlog without annoying the engineers. But at the same time, you know, uh, you, uh, you're you basically continuously doing it because you want to react to your learning process. And that is also something that I think often is not factored in. Um, and, and if you, if you work in these monthly or quarterly, uh, periods, um, you're basically set, you spend a lot of time on planning, preparing, and then reviewing, evaluating instead of actually doing the work. Right. And, um, so I, I really love this, uh, this general theme of continuous everything, because I think it's very powerful for, for companies overall. Mm -hmm. I think there's a risk connected to it. So. Um, on the engineering side or with our admins, I obviously don't want to give them something new to work on every day, right? It's not okay, tomorrow is that, and then is that, and then is that. So this context switching is extremely dangerous. So you need to find the right frequency of pushing for different things. And ideally you have some visibility into what's coming next because I'm, I mean, we don't want to send tickets to our admins and say, work on it. We want to sit together with them and say like, hey, we have this problem. How would you solve it? What is your approach to it? What do we need to consider? And I think they are the ones that can actually find the best solution to, to a problem we have. And if they are just every day working on a new task, this doesn't work anymore. So this is the really complicated part. And that's why I think you can do that in more mature teams that know how to work together already. Um, 
we're trying this more and more and see good results, but I think you can overstretch it. And maybe if we talk again in a year, yeah, I'll yeah. tell you, hey, we moved yeah, back yeah. to quarterly planning because it totally failed. Yeah, ju just maybe as a as an addition, I mean, so I, for, for us, the way we run it is like, I'd say the, the, the discovery funnel is very broad, but it follows specific themes, right? So we have strategic priorities on the discovery funnel that are three to nine months out on the product side. But then as soon as you, it gets into selected for development, right? And even before in the backlog, it is very specific and it's clearly refined. And, you know, even in the refinement, we discover certain, you know, shortcomings or adjustments to the designs, to the flows, um, to ensure that we then can execute seamlessly. Um, and then I think what Philip mentioned earlier, how do you ensure that there's a lot of flow time, right? You're not overwhelming the people with too many things. So for example, we don't do, uh, you know, daily standups because it's just time taken away from the calendar. Yes, it's 10 minutes, but then typically it's 20 or 30 minutes in person. It's usually more 30 minutes. And it's a big group talking about stuff that actually is not unlocking anyone often. Uh, so it doesn't really make sense, right? So people just write in the Slack channel, you know, this is what I'm working on today, you know? And then if there's a blocker, you jump on a call, right? So it's also the culture you create on making sure that if you're blocked as a person, unblock yourself, right? Uh, and, um, and, 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 and I think uh, that's a bit how we run it. But, you know, and I think it always follows strategic vision in terms of what you want to achieve. And um, um, yeah, but it's a, it's a fascinating topic and uh, yeah, really hard to get right, I think especially in a larger org, like, like, like you have 25 folks. Yeah, I think if you have areas where people touch the same stuff all the time that are very dependent on each other, these check-ins can make a lot of sense. As soon as people work on stuff that can function independently, it's just a waste of time because everybody says what they're doing and nobody else cares, right? But for us right now, it works well with these stand-ups, especially in the, in the technology team. But I can imagine a setup where we would need separate stand-ups or a group that does that and a group that doesn't do that because I totally see your point. Um, our calendars are full with meetings and we try to get rid of them. And at some point, maybe stand-ups are good to cancel. Yeah, I, I think it really always depends on the specifics, right? Um, at Fiber, I mean, we had around 100 engineers, like eight people, eight to 10 people in product. We had m multiple different streams at, at any given time. And a lot of time spent on actually strategic alignment and then, you know, execution and execution on all the different streams. So I think I think it's always in context of size and structure and complexity. Uh, there's a lot of moving pieces. Um, but yeah, I think so many, so many great nuggets. Okay, now I'm talking again, like Philip, <laughs> please over all to good. you. <laughs> no, it's all good. It's all good. I think it's, uh, I think it's a fascinating, fascinating discussion. Yeah. Um, just actually wanted wanted to add one thought there. I think like the key thing there with with Kanban is also right. Like I think sometimes you have these urgent and important tickets, and they just they are just important, and because it's I don't know major defect in in some process that just needs to be fixed, and that's it, right? Like I think that's something you just have to accept, and then have to work towards just making that like a rare occasion, um, and and then for everything else. Really, I think then the job from the product management or revenue operations side is to make sure that you can really explain the why the priority is so high. Like, and I think this is this whole thing of like having a really deep understanding of why are we doing this? What does it actually solve? What is the metric that we are you know working against here? And you know, and this is you know like the sum of all of this is the reason why the priority is this and this. And I think if you do it right, then it's basically impossible to give engineers like a new task, like switching around so much all the time. Because like, you know, if, if you take that serious, you would not even like, it's just not, it's just not possible uh, to create so many tasks that go into all those different directions. Yeah. So um, just, just, just a thought. Um, just, uh, you know, like um, I want to, I want to add in one more question uh, um, before like the episode ends and, like um, product management um, is a lot about like talking actually also to customers, doing market research, and you know speaking to the different stakeholders internally, externally, bringing all that together again, um, and then hopefully not finding a compromise, but just a really good solution that works for all. <laughs> um, also tough, 
Um, but yeah, just curious, like, um, how do you handle that, um, that topic, um, of like doing research, user research, um, right. Cause I think there's like in RevOps, there's like the internal side with the marketing and salespeople and then, but there's also like the customer side, like how customers perceive, um, their touch points with marketing and sales. So yeah, really curious how you think about that. Yeah. Uh, it's a really good question. I think there's uh, different layers to it, right? So one thing is internal versus external product. And I consider our mm, revenue technology as a very internal product because most of this, um, the, 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 our customers, like of Heyjob's customers, never see. They experience a journey that we have part in designing, but they never see the systems themselves, really. Um and this is a, a big advantage of an internal product. We have direct access to our users, which are our internal sales reps. So we can talk to them a lot. We sit on the same floor as they do. We understand that they complain about the system. We overhear it. We can jump in. We shadow them. So this is really helpful. And I, I spend a lot of time in thinking about the parallels for like revenue systems or revenue technology and a, a product uh, as you know it. And we try to define what are our customers and what are our users. And I mean, our customer can not really churn because we are, we are internal. They can basically stop supporting everyone to push data into Salesforce. They can stop using Salesforce as heavily. And if sales leads start tracking stuff in sheets because the system doesn't work, that is basically what churn would be for us. So the, the senior management is for us the customer that we want to make sure keeps working with us. And then the users, for them, it has to be feasible. Otherwise, yeah, it, it, it has to be feasible to use the system. It has to be usable. It has to add value to them. They need to know if I do that, I reach my booking targets, for example. So we have these two groups. And I have to say we are, as revenue operations at Heyjobs, very little in touch with the customers of Heyjobs. And that is something where we can explore in the future um, to define the customer journey a bit further. Um, this was part of what the strategy team did in the past when we did that split. And now we're not covering that within RevOps very well. And it's still to be seen if that adds value or this should be done somewhere else um, to define the customer journey, maybe on, on the product side, actually, of the product that our customers really see in a in an interface. Um, so yeah, yeah, I, th I think that I think that's actually a really fascinating topic as well. Like, um, especially from a marketing operations perspective, where you often have many different touch points and figuring out what are the touch points and what is the journey and what's the attribution. And then I think from a um, enablement or excellence uh, perspective, right, like you know, what is actually happening, not just on the system side of things and the user flows and, you know, how data is structured, stored, and then also presented. So it's not, you know, actually working against the reps, but helping the reps to be more successful, which I think is in 90% of my experience, not the case. Um, but, um, but yeah, how do you, how do you actually then really drive enablement that is, uh, that is creating that journey uh, that in B2B often has to do also with meeting somebody, having a conversation, right? Doing deep discovery, really understanding whether you can help and then presenting the solution with all the enablement. Um, um, and I think, uh, I think that's also a fascinating area. Um, um, so I'm super curious what you're going to learn there. And then, you know, we're going to invite you back and we'll talk about all this <laughs> because, uh, because I really like the, the level of detail uh, we heard here today. And um, yeah, thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Um, so maybe before we, uh, before we uh, dash off, like, you know, we ask one closing question and that's, uh, you know, what would you uh, tell yourself, your younger self, if you were to start in RevOps uh, again? Like, yeah, what would that's be? That's very simple, actually. Index? It's like, don't make it complex. That's something... Like in the beginning, we did extremely complex things with covering every edge case and so on. And two months later, the process was just ditched and something else happened in the go-to-market org. And we spent months building it. Um, 
So that's something I would tell myself. Make it as simple as possible. Um, in the beginning, if you don't know how the process goes, if it stands, take it outside of the system, make it manual. If you realize we have doing, been doing this for months, then build it in the system, but make it simple. Fantastic closing words. Paul, thank you so much for joining us. Really enjoyed it. Um, have a great weekend. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thanks, Paul. Bye. Thank you very much for listening to this episode of the RevOps Lab podcast. Please consider to like and subscribe our show and give us a five-star rating on wherever you're listening. If you have feedback or suggestions, let us know at podcast at getweflow.com. We read and reply to every email. Thank you.